Oh, that was horrible. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Much better. Um, I have a background in education. I love the teaching environment, but more than anything, I love to get everybody else involved as well. I promise not to embarrass anyone, uh, but please feel free to talk back to me uh, respectfully, and uh, we can carry on a conversation in this uh, in this session. Um, I wanted to discuss a little bit today about dependency injection, service locators, uh, how that applies to testing, and ultimately to life, um, and the life part we'll see at the very, very end. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, <laughs> this session is not intimidating. Now I need to know, before I go any further, how many of you are developers um, and implement service location, uh, dependency injection, testing of any sort in your application? Okay, great. So then this slide is for you. If you guys are all experts, this slide is going to be for me talking to you. Okay, so we're, not, we're going to just discuss things at a real low level, um, try to make sure that the concepts are familiar to you, uh, maybe answer any questions you have, and then maybe state some use cases on, on when and why you should use them. To give you a little bit of background on myself, uh, my name is David Hurley. Uh, I like to say I'm an open source evangelist because I'm pretty hardcore in open source technologies. Um, entrepreneur, co-founder, uh, blogger, um, volunteer contributor. I do a lot of different stuff. Uh, I'm also um, the community manager for Joomla, which is an open source content management system. How many are familiar with Joomla? Fantastic, that's awesome. Um, I'm also on the production leadership team for Joomla. Um, and a whole, whole bunch of other teams. So I get a lot of opportunity to work in a pretty large organization, uh, volunteer basis, donating time, um, and looking at how we can evolve um, our use of PHP, um, our use of modern technology in a system that maybe was around since 2005, 2003, around those times. So that's a little bit about me. Um, to define some of the terms we're gonna look at today, defense injection, um, Injection or the passing of a dependency to a dependent object or client. Service locator, which again, both of these are design patterns. So a design pattern for service location is when you have a centralized registry and you're making calls to that from uh, most often within a particular function uh, or client. And then inversion of control being just the overarching premise of how um, both service locators and dependency inject actually functions um, in, in how it retrieves that information. Uh, how many of you are familiar with all three of those terms? Okay, great, awesome. So there's, in essence, three types of dependency injection. Um, I'm only going to touch on one today uh, because I don't want to get too technical and get into too many different ways and just make it a confusing mess. Uh, but the one that I wanted to look at was the constructor uh, dependency injection, which is typically your most common one. Um, and basically, with this example, what you see is, okay, so we have a class uh, that might be defined as a car picker, and then we're going to have a function for a car picker. Um, but we need to pass in dependencies into that function, rather than a static or a singleton call within the function itself. Anybody have any ideas why that would be more beneficial to do that way? Anybody? Yes? So you can define like an interface that has multiple classes and you can have kind of a dummy class that you can kind of inject for testing purposes that just returns static data. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And to carry that idea a little further, one of the things that you said which I think is really important is for testing purposes. Right? If you're testing this code, you, you can test this function direct. Right? You don't have to worry that within that function something else is being called um, from outside this function. You can singularize your testing to just this one particular function. Um, the find, this, this right here, what is this? Class. Hinting. Class. It's type hinting. I'm type hinting at what this should be, so I'm just kind of helping myself out so that my code knows what it should be getting throughout the process. Service locators, kind of an animal. Most often it's seen as a singleton registry. There's an asterisk there. I love asterisks because that means that might not always be the case. I'm hedging my bets with that. Um, so in a class, uh, service locator, something like this might be the case. So we have a service locator class. This is what's going to actually return a different static for all of the different variables that we're going to call. Um, and then inside our class, card picker, again, same class, same function, 
Here, we've got finder equal to service locator dot finder. We're using our service locator to go, go grab that information. See why I might not have a lot of favor for this right here? Because now all of a sudden I've introduced something different inside my function that when I'm doing testing is going to make it slightly more difficult. Um, still possible, still very possible. You just have to mock this up as well, right? So not, not, the, end of the, not the end of the world. It's still very easy to do testing with. Um, but I'll show you some other examples maybe in a second for why that wouldn't be a great idea. So what we're not discussing today I'm not wanting to get into a fight with anyone on whether service location or dependency injection is the proper and right way to do it. I'm, I'm not going there. Um, I have good friends that are on both sides of that uh, discussion. I call it discussion because it's not, we're not arguing, right? We're just trying to prove the others wrong. Um, the key, I think, is terminology. Making sure we start with the same set of this is why this is what we're calling this, and why we call it this. I was just in a session a second ago where they talked about having um, you know, a lexicon of sorts, where these are our keywords, and these are why we use those keywords. And that's critically important. Um, how many of you have heard of Paul Jones? Uh, he does R of PHP stuff. Uh, great guy. He's got a book out, which, by the way, if you are working with legacy applications, and you're migrating into a new code base. He didn't pay me to say this. It's just a great book. Uh, he's got a book that you can get on LeanPub uh, for helping you take something that's old school design pattern and move it into more modern technology. Awesome book. Anyway, he has a good write up on one of his blog posts about the differences with um, design patterns, uh, naming conventions. Obviously, the hot topic is uh, Laravel's use of some of their naming conventions. Um, and, and why Taylor chose some of the ones that he did. Uh, again, that's not what we're discussing today. So what are we discussing? Uh, we're looking at what makes our lives easier as developers. And I meant it when I say a pragmatic approach because we're looking at what's going to make our jobs as developers easier in the short term as well as easier in the long term, as well as keeping us safe. And again, I'll get to that at the end. Um, so we're looking at principles and ideas and concepts that you can take and carry with you um, to further your design of your code architecture. How many of you have heard of the law of Denver? No. Awesome. Okay, we'll take a minute on this. Um, so it's a it's a fairly famous law. I guess it's not famous if you guys don't know it. Um, each unit should have a limited knowledge about other units and the only units closely related uh, to the current unit. Um, you only talk to your friends, you don't talk to strangers, and you really only talk to your close friends. You don't really even talk to distant friends or your distant relatives. It's kind of like that holiday party when you don't know anybody but they're all related to you somehow. It's that like the time of who you talk to and who you don't, you talk to your close friends. So the law of are kind of like that. Um, if we look at it in a real life application, what does that mean? Um, so how do you pay your tab when you're at a restaurant? So the waiter comes to you and he brings you your bill. He says, all right, this is what you owe. Uh, it's $22 and some odd cents. Do you open your wallet, take out $22 and some odd cents and give them the money? Or do you give them your wallet and say, go for it, take out the money, do what you need to do? Right? How many of you are actually going to give your wallet to the guy and say, you take out how much you're supposed to take out? Nobody. Nobody. You're going to give him the exact amount because he doesn't need to know anything else that's in your wallet. Right? So in real life application, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about something where you don't need to give more information than the person needs, than the object needs. Um, so that's how that relates here. So if we look at applying a service locator, uh, this might be another use case where you'll see it. Um, so you have a class that's a car. You have some protected variables. You have a function to build your car. And you pass in a locator. Okay? And then the locator actually is what goes and gets the seats, goes and gets the seat belt, and then sets that to your protected private class variable. Um, there's a lot of problems with this in that you don't know what you need unless you go and look 
at that service locator. So when you go to test your code, you're not going to know what everything is that's being used by that build car function unless you've gone and looked through the code and dug through it and found it. And the problem kind of exasperates as it gets bigger and bigger because now all of a sudden you get more and more code that gets injected in. And you don't know when something new gets added along the way. So all of a sudden now, what started with you writing it like this, and it's just two things you call it, no big deal, perfect use for a service locator, I'm just going to grab it from a central location. The next guy comes along, he says, you know what, we didn't need just seats and seat belt, we got to get the door handles, we got to get the steering wheel, we got to get four tires on this thing. So he starts adding in more into the locator, and then more into this function here. It becomes harder and harder to test, because now when you're testing build car, you started by testing just for looking for a seat and a seat belt. That's all you look for. That's all you need to test. That's all your code you have but somebody else comes along and they add to it, they add to it at this layer, or they change something in this layer, and that affects this. Well, now all of a sudden your build car function dies, and you don't know why, because it's not technically dying within this function. This isn't the problem. The problem is existing somewhere else. If you look at dependency injection, you've kind of got a similar scenario. Um, I put this slide first so that it would make it a little more sense in what we're doing. When you're building a car, you're going to actually make have a factory that builds the car, right? So in case of code, we'd have a, a factory class. In that factory class, we'd have our build car, which goes and gets the seat belt, the seats, the car, and then returns the new car. Now, you see what we've done here is we're returning a new car object, and we're only having to pass in one thing, because the, the car doesn't need to, need to know about the seat belt. The car doesn't care about the seat belt. The car just cares about the number of seats that are in it. Right? And you can extrapolate that out if you wanted to. Um, because you can go down to what kind of buckle is on that seat belt. That doesn't matter to the seats, to the car. That matters up here at this level. So what happens is now all of a sudden, we're obeying a law of demeter in that we're not passing stuff to the car that the car doesn't need to know about. We're not giving it more information than it needs to build out. And this becomes super handy when you're testing because it allows you to test just the unique parts of your code. So if you look deeper, if you go into your car class, you set up your constructor with your seats. And again, I'm typing at it. And then we go into our seats class. Well, here, now what I can do is, as things grow, and as I get deeper into it, well, maybe seats actually need two things in the constructor. Maybe I need to get the seat belt, but I also need to get the fabric of what type of that seat's going to be. So if I look back here, I'm just passing in the seats. I don't need to know about the fabric. I don't need to know about the seat belt. I don't need to know about anything other than I just need the seats. And again, um, this is just a real simple explanation, right? Obviously, this isn't a real life. I'm not building a car. <coughs> so this allows me to extend my code base while still making sure that my <coughs> testing principles stay in place. I'm not going to break this function if I break something in this function. Okay, they're unique, and I'm able to test them differently. So if we return to the factory, this is kind of what we were just talking about. So now I've got a seat belt, I can go pull the fabric, or I can some static fabric, and then grab, grab it here, and then pass it in here. So what's the key concept? Well, a factory is typically used um, for all the objects that have the same uh, lifetime. Um, you don't want to end up where um, something that you're injecting has a shorter lifespan than the object that's calling it. Because then you'll get into the case where you have, um, you have failure, failures because the object no longer exists. So when you're doing constructor injection, um, you can only, you should, only inject items whose lifetime is going to equal or greater than the injectee. So if I'm passing in seat to the car as an injection, I need to make sure that that seat object is going to have a lifetime that's uh, equal to or greater than the lifetime of the car. And then you also have method parameter um, where you can do injections for shorter lifetimes. Or you can use something like your request variables um, and just give them directly from, from a state. So for testing, this is where it actually gets kind of important. Um, I don't, what I don't want to talk about is um, test-driven development. How many of you have seen any of the latest little kerfuffles that's going on in the world about test-driven development because a very prominent programmer says he doesn't believe in it, doesn't do it, and doesn't think it should be done. And that got everybody's feathers in a ruffle, and so they say, well, this is why it should be done, and this is why you're wrong. Um, I'm not getting into that at all, okay? I will say, from personal experience, 
um, there is definitely some value in at least getting your head around the code that you're going to be writing before you write it. Um, I can't personally get to the point where I'm actually writing all of my tests before actually writing any code. I struggle with that. Um, but what we are talking about with services uh, dependency injection is um, what makes that testing easier. Uh, with service locators, uh, we get mixed responsibilities, and we also partially break a lot down there. And another thing with service locators that becomes difficult is that it's hard to tell um, what all is needed. It's hard to tell what all is important and where things are breaking at. Because you have to, like I said, you have to go digging for it. You have to find where all those different uh, relationships exist at. Um, dependency injection does allow for easy testing. It's clear to follow, and the law of demeter is obeyed. Um, and that makes it really simple to write your tests, because you can write independent uh, test structures on, on certain functions. How many of you write test functions? How many of you write tests for your code? Excellent. That's good. I'll, I'm going to go with 50% on that. That's pretty good. We'll take that. Um, as a side note, null checking. How many of you do precondition checking? Now that you can see up here why I think it's not really a great idea. Precondition checking works great when you're setting it up. Because, uh, does everybody know what I mean by precondition checking? Okay, so let's say, if I go back a couple slides to where I, I'm building the car out. Let's see if I can get to it real quick. Um, okay. If I'm here at this slide, um, could I build a car without a seatbelt? In real life, yes. In this code, can I build a car without a seatbelt? No, no. Okay, why not? Objection to seats. Okay. Now, if we looked at our seats, I don't think I've got it here. Um, if we went into the seats, and it had seatbelt equal null here, the fabric equal null here, so that it could take a null value. Can I build a, a car without a seatbelt? Yes. But what we'll do is we'll stick in a preconditioned check. Um, what you'll do is you'll stick a line in here that says um, test seatbelt not equal null. Right? You're testing to make sure you don't have a null value on here. But in reality, in real life, if I have a null here, I could accept a null value. And it's not going to keep my car from being built because my seats are still going to be passed in. Does that make sense? So if I do precondition checking on everything to make sure that I exist, then I'm never actually checking whether or not this is actually functioning in and of itself, just this bit. What instead what I'm checking is checking that everything lines up to make a test right. And that's good when you're testing, when you're building out your code, because you want to make sure that you're not missing anything, right? But when you're actually in a production level environment, there's going to be cases where you don't need to do your precondition checking. What you really need to be checking is that something you changed didn't keep the car from getting built. Does that make sense? <coughs> the null checks are really important when you're building your code out, when you're deciding what's important and what's not. When you get to the point that you've already got that figured out, your null checks in a production environment are not as helpful because what they do is they keep your code from running through the actual test of the function that you really are trying to test. So what's the goal? The goal is to write clean, concise, easily testable code, which accomplishes a purpose and allows others to improve it. There's your takeaway. I tried to get it into one sentence. It's a long sentence, but it's one sentence. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about dependency injection. We talked a little bit about service updates. We talked about testing. We're moving around the world, right? Yeah, this is great. Only thing left to talk about is life. Um, so, I really would like to have some feedback from you guys. Um, how many of you, hmm, let's have a little go at it. Okay, let's start with this. How many of you use frameworks when you're developing applications? Okay, excellent. Um, is anybody willing to tell me what framework they choose most often to use? Codeigniter or work. Codeigniter? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Anybody else? Laravel. Laravel. How many of who else uses Laravel? Okay. Um, what's your reasoning for using Codeigniter? It was there. It was there. I started with Codeigniter. That was one of the first frameworks that I used. Loved it. It was a fantastic platform and great docs, right? I mean, it had fantastic resources. Um, I'm trying to think, in the latest release, before Taylor moved on to other stuff, um, did they end up doing anything with service locators or dependency injection? No clue. Okay. I don't think that they even went there. Um, so you lose out on a lot of value. Uh, with that one, um, but I really liked that framework. 
um, as a good starting point. Uh, with Laravel, Laravel goes a different route a little bit because they use uh, facades. Um, yes, thank you, facades in quotes. Um, and that was Taylor's uh, choice in how he wanted to, to name, uh, name that. Um, it's really important when you're building an application that you think through the reasons why you choose the framework that you choose and the code that you're writing. Um, we use frameworks because we're trying to get to the part of the code that's actually fun, right? We use frameworks because we don't want to waste our time writing the base, the base you know, HTTP request handling. That stuff's already been done a million times over. Why do I need to write it again? Um, what I want to do is I want to get to the point where the code that I'm writing is business relevant. It's the piece that's actually going to be making me money for developing this for the client or just because it's actually the part that's fun to write. Um, so when you're choosing your frameworks that you use, you're choosing it because of the value that it brings to you. And the value that these frameworks can bring to you are really going to be dependent on the testing that you have to do and how you have to write your code to get the result that you want. So we talk about dependency injection, we talk about service locators, um, and there's pros and cons to both. There are cases where service locators um, are useful, usually within a small, uh, small subset, and typically they end up looking slightly different than the service locator, but more like factory class, which is something fancy. <coughs> so there is some crossover between the two. Um, but really the ultimate goal is to make it so that it's clean and concise, and that you get the most value out of it, and that it goes on past you. Because this is where it relates to you in real life. Okay, by having a short code base, which can be easily read and understood by others. And I love this quote, because always code is that the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> this is where it applies to your life. Maybe not to this extreme, but in reality it's true, right? Because we all get involved in the projects that we're working on, we all spend the time on them, we develop the patterns that we're comfortable with, uh, we write the code the way that we expect it to be written and how we're going to read it later. It's often very easy to forget that there are other people that are at some point in the future going to be maintaining screwing up, working on your code base. Um, by adhering to some standardized definitions, by adhering to some standard common practices in how you write your code, you make sure um, that the next guy knows what's going on and that he's able to continue that work and hopefully continue it uh, with the same level of quality that you're putting into it. So I would like to leave a lot of time at the end just to answer questions because I know with a topic like this, I can get up here and talk all day long about different principles and different uh, concepts that can be extremely uh, overwhelming and maybe not even make a whole lot of sense. So I would love to see if you guys will start to interact with me a bit and give me some questions, um, discussion, argue with me if you disagree. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Does anybody have anything? Let's, I'll start with some easy ones. Um, does anybody have any questions about dependency injection? How you would use it, when you would use it, or why you would use it? Yes? I think it's more of a real world, like, world example than cars and doors. Because I keep seeing cars, but I want people to do it. Okay, so in a real life example of a dependency injection, um, I think I put on the spot, okay? Um, if you've got a user class and you're going to set your user object, um, let's, let's change it around. Let's say that you're actually going to log the user in, okay? If you're going to log the user in, you're going to need two bits of information at least, at a minimum. You're going to need their username and you're going to need their password, right? So what you've got is the different ways in which you can retrieve that username and password. This one's a bit tricky because that could have a short lifetime, depending on your session length. Um, but you can inject into your user class that username and password, and then within your user class is where you actually do the authentication of the user. So what you would do is you would pass in um, the username, and this is, I mean, this is cheap because I'm passing in strings, uh, but you would pass in those items into the class, and then the class is going to process them. Um, you may not always want to have um, your yeah, user class be having to require username and password as part of your class level events injection. So that's where I say you might use a method um, or something similar. Another example would be like a profile. So if you've got a user profile and that's your class for the user profile, 
you're always going to need to have a user that that profile is associated with. So you might pass in your user object, which has been authenticated somewhere else already. So you have an authenticated user class, and you're going to pass that in <coughs> to your profile class to pull out any relevant information that you need from the user. Does that make sense? Does that give you any more clarity? Sure. Um, in the past, I've seen it used for logging, actually. What do you think about that idea? Like, pass it, like you create a log object sort of thing that can handle your methods that you want to use, and then you pass in that full object. If you want to log it again, then you can log directly from within the class. I'm just curious. So you would log directly. So what would your class call me then? So you would. How would you instantiate that? You would inject the log, like, you spell the log very well, just log. Uh huh. And so you would say log, you know, pair or whatever. So if, you had, so if you had an error class and you needed to um, store something into the log file, you're just going to take whatever parameter gets passed into that log variable and store that out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the goal often with dependency injection is, again, we're trying to obey that law of Demeter where we're taking a whole bunch of information and we're kind of siloing it out so that you know maybe that log wouldn't be just a string variable, but maybe that log would actually be an entire log class. Um, and it would contain you know, the error number and a whole bunch of other parameters. Then in that case, yeah, absolutely, you have an error class. It accepts the log um, as a dependency injection, and then processes different things against that log class. Absolutely, that'd be a, a perfect use case. Anybody else? Service locators, Did anybody use service locators? Yes, in service locator just another way to pull the variables in and out, which might things like that. Which would be like registry, right? Yeah, it's basically, um, and so I can talk a little bit of personal experience on this because in the Joomla CMS community, um, they kind of brain into that. They've got a J Factory class, which is a horrible name because they've used J Factory, and it's not technically a factory for registry. It's just basically all your global configs. Um, and the reason I say that's horrible because it gets really dirty really fast. If you look at Joomla code uh, for testing purposes, it's, it's absolutely a nightmare. And it's, it's the reason why probably 70% of the Joomla code base cannot be properly unit tested. Because what happens is inside every function, there's a DB call. J factory get DBO. And that DBO is passing in all of the params. It came from a configuration file somewhere. Gets stored into the J factory class, and then the J factory class is just static called from a billion different places throughout the entire system. So by doing it like that, what ends up happening is you can't ever test just that one function. Because now all of a sudden, every time you try to test that one function, it's making a call against another factory class, which has a billion different records in it, and all of a sudden you have this global type of environment where it's just basically passing globals around. Each function has a lot of state. Exactly. So in Joomla, some like to say it's not a service locator, and others would argue that it, it is indeed a service <coughs> locator pattern that we're following. Um, and it tends to be a bit of one. And in reality, in reality, that uh, service location is actually an anti-pattern. It's not even really a pattern. It's doing the opposite of what you really want it to do, because it's passing in way more data than you really ever needed, and making it so that you can't properly test your code if you use it wrongly. Yes? You could shim that by making an inner function that takes as a uh, parameters what you're actually using and then that becomes a testable function. We've looked at that as doing that and we've started to implement some things like that. The, the sheer volume of lines of code that are involved and when you make a change and so the thing is for those of you that may not know Joomla is currently the second CMS behind WordPress and it runs about 9% so, of, of the web I think it is. It's running on Joomla right now. So if a change gets made and we do something like that there's so much prep that has to go into it because if we blow up 9% of people in the web up there, we're going to have a little bit of a storm on our hands. Um, so, but yeah, absolutely, that's one of the things that we're talking about is if we can shim it. And because one of the other things that we're trying to do in Joomla, side note, uh, is introduce namespacing um, so that we don't we can do more of a lazy loading type of environment. We don't have to do we can we can use some of the PSR stuff, um, and we're using we're using some uh, shims for that too. So just some aliasing, basically, to our class records. But yeah, that's an absolute. That's that's the way to do it because eventually, at that point, then we can eventually break away from using that J factory altogether uh, and move to more of a testable approach with injection. So yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. So if, 
I want to describe something and maybe you can tell me what pattern it is, if it's a pattern. Okay, I'll try. So in some of the code that I've seen, you'll have functions where they'll call new, which mm -hmm. automatically makes it dependent on that other class. Mm -hmm. So taking those out and putting it into, say, like a helper class, where instead of calling you new, you say get this class from this helper, and the helper then returns the new to you. Is that? So personally, my thoughts on helpers are they're dirty. Helpers are, uh, helpers are a way around writing better code. That's not to say that I don't use them. There's always times when the helper is just the best way to get something done. Um, but in general, that helper, it, it's a slippery slope. Because then all of a sudden, well, what goes into the helper? What goes into the corresponding model that it should be going into? And at what point now is all of a sudden that helper file not really a helper file, but now it's a factory that's used in the service locator activator and it's blown out to be two, you know, two billion lines long. Um, depending on how much you're using that helper file and where you're using it would kind of define how it's, what it's technically being used as, as a design pattern. My guess is it's a bit of a service locator. Uh, because what you're doing is you're using that to retrieve something else and then return it to your object, right? Um, and then I would always go back to, what does that do for testing? Is that making my testing easier or harder? Or does it completely break my testing where I'm no longer testing this, I'm testing this, this, and this, this? Well, the reason that it, it has been helpful is I can mock that, that object and only return the one thing that I need. So I just say sure. mock this object, and when I make a call to this class, return this JSON object or something like that. Sure, instead. okay, I can see that, I can see that. Um, Rather than having the new, where you have to mock the new, and you have to then mock every, everything else that goes along with that. Okay, I'd be interested in actually seeing that, maybe later, if you have time, or if it's something like I could, I could draw it up for yeah. you, I don't have the code. Yeah, yeah, on I would, I'd be interested in seeing how you're using that as an in between. Other questions? Did you guys have? Yes. I well, have a question for testing. Yes. I don't know if on that subject yet, but. <laughs> so, in our, in our organization, we start out with for test coverage. We're <laughs> talking like maybe 1%. And at the time, it was fine because no one ever left. So now sure. everyone's gone. <laughs> nice. And we'll fight the battle now. Yeah. Um, so we're now shifting, we've got to, we maintain our code service. So we, we track it, we have different models that are higher than, than others. Uh, we try and shoot for about 70, 80%. Is that generally the best and how, I mean. As far as code coverage? Yeah, code coverage. Why would you shoot for 70% as opposed to 100%? We question that, we talked about that because to get to 100%, we're testing things like getters, setters, mm -hmm. testing, um, parameter checks for you know, things that may not be super at a break, sure. you know, fine, but sure. what we're testing are our, our end of the setup curve. Yeah. So we, we're trying to shoot for 70, 80, is about what we shoot for. We have some modules that are at 93, mm -hmm. they, they do check all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So general consensus, we try to shoot for 70, 80, just because some of our areas are so low. You know, and that's what, that's what I was going to say. If you're at 1%, 5%, 10%, then absolutely shoot for 80 because that's way better than what you got, right? And then once you're hitting 80% code coverage and everything, I think then it's worthwhile to even still go back and finish out the 20% so that everything is fully tested. That way, no matter what you change in the code, you'll know if it breaks. And we've actually had great success with the one module that's mm -hmm. at 93 because we had a different department come back and say, hey, we need to actually use part of that, but you need to split it out because we're, we're, we're the SA, we do SAS, you guys are a client, yeah. so split it out. <laughs> and, well, we've never done that before, but let's try it. So we yeah. split it out and ran all the tests and saw immediately what broke, yeah. fixed it all, voila, yeah. there you go. You're, you're it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Because as, and that's where testing really becomes valuable is over time. Mm -hmm. Testing it immediately is nice, right? It's nice to feel like, yeah, I've got my code tested, that's pretty awesome. But when you get, you know, four years, five years down the road, and you're in production environments, and all of a sudden, something has to be changed, 
maybe it's something silly like your PHP version on your server has to change and update, and now all of a sudden, you know you have to make a change within a certain function on a certain class, and you don't know what that's going to break when you make that change. That level of fear and uncertainty is horrifying. You just hate it, especially if you're on something where you're production level, you know? And obviously you're going to sandbox it, right? But you still, there's always that doubt that if I haven't tested it, I don't know for sure that that thing's going to be just right. And am I going to get that call at 2 in the morning that I've broken something serious? So This was, this was two years after it after yeah. been made. Yeah. Luckily, you know, I was still there, so I knew how like, it could be split out. So yeah. We could do that. Uh, but we had multiple customers using what we had now, and we didn't want, we can't break them just to right. facilitate another department. Exactly. So yeah. the unit test turned out to be invaluable because we knew immediately we could run, you know, the thousands of unit tests that we have in yeah. five minutes, and knew what we could Yeah. Versus trying to do it manually, <laughs> we started working on it. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It takes forever to run through every line. Yeah. And every scenario, right, that the test coverage would use. How many of you guys use something like PHP unit or unit testing of some kind? Okay, great. Any other kinds of testing that you guys use? What's that? Selenium, Selenium, Selenium. testing. How many of you guys use Selenium testing? Excellent. Yep, yeah, Carmen and Jasmine. Um, oh, I was kidding. I just thought of a name of one. I can't think of it. It just slipped my mind. There's some nice testing that you can do, yeah, from the usability. The usability testing, the, the interface testing is really helpful. Um, because just because the code works doesn't mean that it actually is laying out right on your page. So it's important to make sure that just because the, the code behind it's working, the design layout um, is still intact and functional in the form it exists as it's supposed to. So, yeah. And, yes? Um, I, I saw Somebody mentioning dependency injection is a good um, replacement for like singleton pattern. Mm -hmm. Singletons are bad, and dependency injection will help you fix that. Yes. But I'm trying to see how that works. Could you explain that a little bit? How would you? I mean, singleton seems to solve the problem if I need a single instance of something, and I, I'm trying to see how dependency injection would solve that problem. It did, that's where the lifetime of the object comes into play. Because with dependency injection, if the lifetime of that object remains uh, longer than where you're injecting it, then basically what you're doing is you're passing in an instance, right? So instead of using a singleton um, where you're having to declare statics, statics just in general tend to be difficult. Uh, that's, that's one of the main reasons why people say, eh, singleton's a really bad pattern to follow. Um, dependency injection gives you the benefits of having a lifetime session type of object, um, while still maintaining a dynamic code base that you can uh, continue to work with. Um, so there's there's certainly times, and I still see singletons all the time. I still see them because that's just a very, it was a common practice to use them, right? And so a lot of people are just comfortable writing it in the singleton where it's a static. Uh, and you know it's going to stay the same um, unless you physically do something to it. Um, but by making it a dependency injection like that, it becomes a lot easier to test your code because then you're not having to set up statics and mock up all those uh, singletons uh, along the way within your tests. So how would you structure that for, say, like a uh, database connector or something like that? How would, you, would that work with your dependency injection? Or Absolutely. One of the things, um, I'm actually giving a second talk later today on the Joomla framework because Joomla is a CMS um, we kind of wanted to go to that next level, right? And look at doing better stuff than just what we've got with the statics. Um, and so we started building out uh, the Joomla framework as a way for everybody to develop applications, you know, similar to you know, Laravel, Symfony, E, some of these other frameworks. Um, we wanted to use one that used the same code base that the CMS used, so the developers that were familiar with Joomla could also use the framework. Um, in that, one of the things that we were deciding on was how we wanted to handle things like a database call. And that became extremely easy to pass in as a class level injection throughout all the different, um, all the different packages within the Joomla framework. Um, because then, and the way that we ended up using it with the Joomla framework, um, you have to have some sort of record locator, right? Because you have to store those values somewhere and you have to be able to accept, access them. You don't have to put them in a static file. You, know, you could put them in the database itself 
and figure out some way to retrieve them for database, but a static file is always the way that things tend to go with a JSON string or something like that. Um, so you have to have some manner of record location at that base level to at least get those initial rules <coughs> in. Um, so what ended up happening was, if you look in the Joomla framework packages on GitHub, it, we've got one for the, um, for the database. And with the database, we also have a factory class. That factory class is where you store um, those variables that you're going to use. And then you just inject the entire database class as an injection into all your other classes. And so then what you're doing is you're passing in those uh, static level variables that your user class that needs to access the database but doesn't need to know what the database username, database password, database connection is, can use the database object because you've injected it in. And then the database object is the one that calls the factory class to get your actual static level uh, string, your string values. Does that make sense? So are you, are you creating a new instance every time you, are you creating a new instance of all those variables and stuff every time you inject it into another class? No, it's going to be, it's going to hold the same because we're calling it from the factory. The, the factory holds it once and then the database class is just being passed repeatedly all over. It's the same connection unless you close it. I mean, unless you close that. It's going to be the same connection. It's going to get passed it repeatedly. Which is the benefit and the value of what we're doing right now, which is that JFactory get DBO, where it's a static call each time, new connection, new connection, new connection. And that's horrible. <laughs> but it's just bad on so many levels. So. I've used it that same way. Just inject a database instance pretty much in every class, in any class that uses, needs it, you know. And then set it to, I mean, I you can set it to a single variable. single route, and it just didn't work with my structure. I don't remember why exactly. Pass, passing it in, and then setting it to a private class level variable, and then using it as a list DB throughout your entire class, is just incredibly, incredibly easy to do. So with that, that, that static variable then inside the database class, are you, are you treating that as a static variable so that it's open once and nobody else has to worry about it? Or where's the control on that? You know what, I'd have to look at our factory class on the database package. I'll do that though, um, and then uh, let you know. I'll catch up with you. Because I, I, I need to know that too, for reference. Okay. Any other questions? You guys feel comfortable with dependency injection? Service locators? Do you think you could write something with a dependency injection? Okay. Do you think you could write a unit test to check a, a function that you've written with a dependency injection? Awesome. Do you think it's important that your code is clean and neat and easy to follow? No. <laughs> how many of you, along those lines, how many of you write comments on your functions? Please, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, let's say your application is due tomorrow and it's 11.30 p.m. How many of you write comments on your functions? <laughs> nice. See, those are the two, those are the two tests. Yes? I am the violent psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> you are the violent psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. So, I appreciate you guys coming in. Um, I definitely am more than happy to answer other questions later. Um, I'm going to look up that one for you uh, on our database factory. And um, if you're interested, come back. I think it's the same room. I'll talk about the general framework and kind of what we're doing with that. Um, and maybe we'll get into some details there as well about the different stuff that we're doing. So thank you guys very much.